welcome to MV Lecture Series. And I'd love to say welcome also to those of us who are joining online, but alas, we've made the call that um, that ship has sailed. Um, we apologise profusely for those watching the recording now at home. We will get that recording up online as quickly as possible and apologies for the technical glitch. To begin, I am honoured uh, to live and work on the lands of the Boon and the Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my deep respects to their elders past and present. And also to all First Nations people joining us tonight or watching this video online. My name is Beck Carland and I am the Senior Curator of the History of Collections and tonight I will be your host. But I will also be presenting as part of the Sunrise Project team. We have three speakers tonight, myself, Dr Liddy Neville and Dr Chris Wilson. We're going to have a Q&A at the very end of the session, so please keep your questions in mind and at the very end we'll all answer your questions. And before we begin, just a note of caution that tonight's presentation includes images and voices of deceased persons. In particular, two respected and loved teachers from the Sunrise School are no longer with us, Queenie Aitkenhead and Marg Falshaw. So, to the Sunrise Collection. If I could just get the next slide. Oh, I can do that, sorry. The Sunrise Collection, Turtle Robots, Lego Logo and The Classroom. Tonight, as part of History Month, we're going to share with you the work in progress researching, documenting the Sunrise Collection. As is often the case with new acquisitions, this one started as an inquiry that came to me just a few weeks before Christmas in 2021. Dr Liddy Neville reached out and said she had a collection of early computer things for education. She also mentioned that she had run a computer classroom or computer school at the old museum and that there were some other projects that perhaps were now historic. Liddy and I then spent a lot of 2022 sorting and culling material at her house. It was a lot a computer hacked by Julian Assange, early laser disks, all manner of dead and dying computer monitors, endless boxes of documents and floppy disks, and a number of really interesting robots and educational toys. Boxes of VHS tapes and audio cassettes, and albums of photographs. Eventually, I proposed the acquisition of a small collection of objects and mixed media. But collection work requires time and money to digitise, document and make accessible. Late last year, Lydia and I discovered we were successful in applying for a grant from the Telematics Trust of Victoria, which is now allowing us to do exactly that work. The team has officially been working on the project since May this year when Dr Chris Wilson came on board as the Sunrise Curator. But at one day a week, it is still very early days in the project. Each of us bring a slightly different lens to the work. Chris has spent much of his time so far placing Sunrise within an educational and an inter institutional context. I've been busy with the mechanics of acquisition, digitisation, research, documentation. And Liddy, of course, brings her extraordinary lived experience and expertise. We don't always agree on what is significant or even relevant, but from experience, I can attest that this will ultimately make for a much stronger collection. Tonight, we will present the work we've been doing, which we hope will also reveal the significance of the collection to the history of education, computing and innovation in Victoria. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Chris Wilson, curator of the Sunrise Project. Chris is a research specialist and educator. Over the past 30 years, he's been involved in interdisciplinary social research and teaching endeavours that draw on concepts and methods from history, media studies, education, human geography, 
policy studies and economics. Some of the projects he's worked on include a history of Australian Youth Radio and the Australian Digital Inclusion Index. He's taught in secondary schools and at undergraduate and postgraduate levels in the higher education sector. Tonight, he's going to pre present a concise framework for understanding the period of time we're looking at and Liddy's and therefore Sunrise's place within that context. Over to you, Chris. Thanks so much, Beck. Um, it's an uh, honour to be here and I'm super excited. Um, when I uh, first heard about the Sunrise Collection from a col an old colleague who's actually here tonight, um, I was instantly excited. Uh, it, it's, it really intersects with um, a bunch of my research interests, things that I've been pursuing over the past 30 years in education and, and digital access and use. And, and so, so from that side of things, it was really interesting from an intellectual point of view. But it also sparked my interest because I was a teenager in the mid to late 80s, and I distinctly remember the introduction of computers into my own school education, which was unusually because I was um, actually at Menangatang Consolidated School in the Mallee, and I guess it's a sort of testament to the extent to which um, computers took hold that we even got them way out there. Um, I've always been frustrated by the fact that um, I was using the logo software that, that uh, is, is a key part of the, the Sunrise story um, during that time in the Mallee, uh, but never actually finished the drawing of a pterodactyl that I'd started. So I'm really hoping I might be able to fire up one of the old machines and get that done as a part of this project. Uh, in any case, um, since joining the project in May, um, I have been, as Beck said, trying to historically situate the Sunrise Collection um, and to explore its significance. Um, I've been drawing on a range of sources for this. Obviously, discussions with Liddy are really important um, for that lived experience. The Sunrise Collection itself, the materials we have to hand, as well as the archives of uh, Museums Victoria and the Australian Council for Educational Research, and I'll refer to them as ACER um, throughout the remainder of the presentation, uh, and some secondary literature. Those two bodies, Museums Victoria and, the, and ACER, are important because they were uh, key players in bringing together the Sunrise School at the museum. So, uh, tonight's presentation will really focus on this Sunrise School at the museum. Um, as part of the work we've been doing, we've realised just how extensive Liddy's work has been in educational technologies. And we've really been trying to grapple with what falls within and outside the scope of the Sunrise Project and the Sunrise Collection. For me, um, I'm really interested in the emergence of the Sunrise School and its impact um, at the museum itself. So before I go on to look at uh, the development, the demise, and the derivatives of that school, um, I will tell you a little bit about it and what it was. So Sunrise School at the museum was a collaborative, practice-based research and development venture established in 1987 by ACER and the museum and Museum Victoria. And it operated between 1988 and 1989. Physically, it was a small space in the north rotunda of the old Russell Street Museum site. In the rotunda, far lat was pushed aside to make way for 10 Apple IIe computers running the Logo Rider software. Some robotics equipment, largely Lego and Lego um, Technic controllers, um, as well as a few other peripherals. I'll get into more detail about the kind of aims of the venture but suffice it to say that the overall objective was to explore and document how computers might alter learning and teaching processes. To do this, the Sunrise School partnered with nearby Princess Hill Secondary College, bringing a class of students into the museum two afternoons a week with their teachers to explore learning by using this equipment that was made available within the museum context. While Princess Hill was the core group, uh, the school was also, and the school facilities were also made available to pre-service teachers from Footscray Institute of Technology, and there was also some sort of existing teacher professional development work. There was some uh, discussion around whether there would be some public access to the school, um, but that was really not realised during uh, the time that the school existed. So how did this venture emerge? 
and why is it important in the history of a computer, computing education in Victoria and Australia? So firstly, it's important to note that the Sunrise School was not at the forefront of the introduction of computers into schools. By 1987, computers had been used in Victorian schools for around a decade or so, although their diffusion really increased in the three to four years prior to the school's launch. In the early 1970s, schools and teachers had managed some access to computers, mainly through remote terminal access to mainframes, large and expensive computers that were, were largely owned and held by universities. One interesting innovation during this period was the introduction of um, logo software um, using this remote terminal access um, in 1975. This was a programming language developed at the Artificial Intelligence Lab of MIT, and that would become an important part of the project uh, here with the Sunrise Story. In 1975, the Tasmanian teacher, Scott Brownell, uh, had returned from a trip to MIT with a copy of this software, and along with a colleague, Sandra Willis, he demonstrated it and the turtle robots that are now um, of the type that are now part of the uh, Sunrise Collection uh, around Tasmanian schools. By the late 1970s, uh, the use of computers became, or the use of computers in schools became much more possible with the introduction of microcomputers, desktop machines. One Victorian school acquired one of these in 1976, but it was really in the early 80s that things took off. One of the reasons for the diffusion of computers at this time was um, some significant financial support from the federal government after it received a report about the importance of computers for school education. So by 1987, with computers now rolled out across a range of Australian schools, as far as Menangatang indeed, um, ACER, Australia's premier education research body, decided it was time to evaluate their use and impact. To do so, uh, the ACER established its education and technology research theme. And they actually hired Liddy to lead this program. Liddy was well known in educational computing circles at this point in time, having spent uh, the early 1980s you know, encouraging the diffusion of, of computers into school and non-school settings. She'd also in, uh, written a couple of books about Logo and particularly its use uh, in the learning process. Since its establishment in the 1930s, ACER was really known for standardised uh, testing and also formal structural evaluations of learning and teaching models and practices. It was this type of approach that ACER intended to bring to the education and technology theme. But Liddy came to the project with a fundamentally different approach. I'm simplifying, of course, but Liddy's approach drew on a particular set of work from educational technologists, mainly associated with MIT in the 1960s and 1970s, who presented an argument that computers should not simply be viewed as a new form of technology to be integrated into existing teaching and learning practices but might actually be used to radically rethink learning and teaching itself. This education technology movement centred on the work of Seymour Papert, uh, who developed the constructionism uh, theory of learning outlined in his book Mindstorms. It was a very popular uh, book and one that was really um, widely, widely read uh, across Australia and, and, and other countries interested in uh, educational reform. And he also played a key role in using the Logo software, which intersected with this learning theory. As Audrey Waters highlights in her research on the history of teaching machines, Papert and others in this education technology movement were effectively joining up nascent kind of computer developments with their contemporaries in educational philosophy who were espousing the need for radical change to the education system. A range of education theorists at this point in time considered the system to be seeped in control, oppression, exploitation and imperialism. For reference, I've lifted a few of these authors on the slides um, and you can see the sorts of um, thinking they had about schooling and, its, and the potential damage that schooling was doing. 
So for Liddy, like Papert and others, evaluating the impact of the existing use of computers um, as they had been integrated into the classroom might actually reinforce a limited role for computers, might actually close off opportunities for, um, for how computers could be used to radically um, alter the uh, teaching and learning process. Through Liddy's leadership, determination, and I dare say um, a sort of headstrong approach, ACER decided to shift its focus from one of evaluation uh, to one of exploration. And so was born the idea of developing a school of the future to explore the possibilities for rethinking learning and teaching through the use of computers. Although the idea was articulated um, as a school of the future, it was initially considered that a standard school would not be a great place to do this type of exploration. And this was really in alignment with some of these progressive texts around the sort of death of schooling and the end of schooling. Indeed, when launching the school uh, at the museum in 1988, the invitation stated, students and teachers in conventional schools are subject to the culture of their schools and generally this does not support autonomous learning by the students or teachers or teaching by the teachers. For this reason, a school was not considered to be a suitable site for this project. So you might ask, how did this come to be that the school was placed at the museum? Well, at around the same time, the museum was in itself engaging in a major review of its own operations. And as a part of these operations, there was a proposal to turn a site at Spotswood into a science and technology museum. When Liddy and ACER appro ACER approached the museum as a potential site, they could really see the opportunity for how a school of the future based around computers and robotics would fit into a science and technology museum. The museum itself had existing links with the education sector and could really sh see how they could showcase high technology education to teachers and the public. In fact, an early kind of model of what the museum was thinking was what they called the classroom of the future, where you'd kind of walk through this architectural space of a sort of 1930s classroom and then into this new high-tech realm of computers and robotics. The museum would come to see or move from this notion of, of, of sort of, uh, sort of demonstrator site to be much more engaged in the notion of exploring the learning outcomes. But there was certainly a, a notion of this kind of thinking around what a museum usually does, which is to display. So once, that, once there was an agreement around that shift uh, in 1987, ACER and the museum decided to establish what was now renamed, not the School of the Future, which seemed somewhat pretentious, uh, the Sunrise School. It would operate out of the Russell Street site, um, the existing site, Spotswood at that point, and Science Works had not been developed. Uh, and they recruited Princess Hill College to provide teachers and a class of year eight students who would be active research participants, sorry, participants for three years when the school was launched in 1988. I'd love to be able to tell you that the school got on without any issues and that reported clear evidence that of the ability for computers to play a role in radically rethinking learning and teaching. This would clearly be an indication of its historical significance, but I can't. So the realities of exploring new territory. Instead, what I can tell you is that the Sunrise School at the museum highlighted the complexities of a multi-institutional collaborative project. There were all sorts of logistics issues from the use of space to security, um, access to furniture, all sorts of, all sorts of um, issues that were day-to-day well, -day issues around trying to get the school operational. And then after two years of operation, the two organisations were never to agree on a satisfactory agreement between themselves on operating the school. So at the end of 1989, ACR decided to terminate the arrangement. Secondly, at the end of the second year of operation of the, of the school, the students at Princess Hill banded together to withdraw their participation. 
A few things lay beneath this. One was around logistics. It was cutting into their lunchtime. There was additional schoolwork to do. But what I've seen in some of the videos and some of the other evidence I've looked at is that there was a discomfort in going into a learning environment that they were unfamiliar with. Again, if you're operating right at the boundaries of learning and teaching, and if you're a student used to those general routines of the schooling day, then it can be um, uncomfortable and um, disconcerting. Some thrived and, uh, and some did not uh, enjoy this new approach. Third, despite the action-based research objectives of the project and the collection of some evidence of learning practices, and some of these will be included into the Sunrise Collection at the museum, the site actually produced limited research outputs. This was largely as a result of the lack of research resources, and it was an issue that Liddy uh, constantly um, raised with the Sunrise Board. None of this is to say that the students engaging with Sunrise did not produce great work, that they didn't, that this, that this type of um, shift in the learning framework didn't have an impact upon them, that there wasn't any benefits to doing this type of exploratory work. I'm simply just not glossing over the difficulties that one faces as an explorer at the edges and the margins. Those that fearlessly launch into the unknown uh, sometimes do not always get it right the first time. So then, why is it that the school, a Sunrise School at the museum is important? To answer this question, I want to refer to a quote from David Loder, former principal of Methodist Ladies College, which he would drive to become the world's first laptop school. And this is detailed in Bob Johnson's book, Never Mind the Laptops. In 1988, David accepted the invitation to, to attend the launch of the Sunrise School, which he notes was operated by the reputable ACER. Having read the provocation laid out in the invitation about the constraints of the existing school setting, David had this to say. The audacity of the challenge to schools was not in the rhetoric. We have read books by Ivan Illich and John Holt, who have argued that schools are bad places for young people. The audacity of Sunrise comes in that ACER and the Museum of Victoria were not simply talking but it actually established a significantly different educational setting. The statement highlights the significance of the Sunrise School at the museum in a number of ways, including in its creation of a setting for not only developing ideas about computing and education, but actually enacting them in a substantial way. It inspired dialogue within and beyond the education sector around alternative and more progressive uses for computers in education reform. It created a reputational or reputable institutional structure and a brand that was then leveraged to attract additional funds for ancillary activities like bringing in international experts and being the foundation for a gener sorry, and also being the foundation for generating derivative sunrise projects that would extend the exploration to new sites with more functional models of collaboration, more impact on changing school practices and generating significant research outcomes. These included the Sunrise Centre at MLC, uh, initiated with David Loder, that then went on to, to um, in, you know, influence the laptops program there, as well as Sunrise Centres in Queensland and New South Wales. So the takeout message. I like to think about the Sunrise School at the museum as like the first pancake. It never turns out great, but if you don't go there, you're not gonna have any pancakes. So it's that moment of launching into the unknown. The Sunrise School at the museum led the way in opening up a significant space for rethinking computers and learning. And it threw down the gauntlet to others like David Loder to be fearless in exploring these in practice. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. So now on to me. Um, 
Look, as Senior Curator of the History of Collections, I spend a lot of my time collecting, researching and documenting uh, objects we already have in the State Collection, but I also spend a lot of time building the State Collection through contemporary collecting projects. Uh, I worked on the Victorian Bushfires Collection that was developed after Black Saturday in 2009, and I spent all of the pandemic, working on a cross-disciplinary project called Collecting the Curve, which documents the experience and the impact of the pandemic here in Victoria. So whilst I am the curatorial sponsor of this acquisition of the Sunrise Collection, um, I'm not an expert in computing history or the history of education. Rather, the expertise I'm bringing to the table is in creating a collection that reflects an historic moment, movement or experience, which can then be used to exhibit, research or illuminate that experience with a particular focus on Victoria. This is what I bring to all of my work. So today, I'm gonna to share with you some of the material that we've flagged for acquisition. We're only acquiring a tiny fraction of what was on offer in the many rooms of Liddy's house. Um, and I can only show you a tiny fraction of the things we did acquire today. Um, so I'll just say that, oh, that quote comes from the original inquiry from Liddy when she first reached out saying, I've got some early computer things. These are some of the things. There are two broad categories of material being acquired into the collection. We have physical objects and then digital media, images, uh, videos and audio. We're not retaining the original formats of any of those and I know that will terrify some people but um, this is simply a space uh, consideration for us and in some instances like the VHSs, um, it's that it's their dying medias, literally the tapes themselves will crumble. Um, we're collecting six, actually no, we're collecting eight robots. The state collection does already contain some of this material, robotics and educational uh, and programmable toys, but Liddy had particular pieces that we did not. And more importantly, she had this deeply lived, connected provenance for each item. This one, the Valiant Turtle, is perhaps the most recognisable of the robot, robots, or at least I've come to realise that um, as it seems, seems to resonate with every 40-something adult who was a student in the 80s, I've come to realise. Um, so this is the Valiant Turtle. The Valiant was produced in the UK in 1983. These educational robots were closely associated with the work of Seymour Papert and used... Um, Lego programming language, and they were run by BBC microcomputers, as you can see in this um, recreation video. Um, the turtle operated wirelessly, which seems wild to me at the, at, for that time. Um, it used infrared, allowing the pro and they came with this pencil mechanism inside the body, which allowed the programmer to create a design using logical step programming. Now, they moved really super slow. This is sped up to five times, um, super slow. Now, this obviously isn't our turtle, um, and I implore you to go and check out Simon In's website. I've put a link there on the top. It's a beautiful um, restoration project, and it does go on for a really long time. Um, our, our one, which is uh, on the table tonight for your viewing pleasure, um, isn't as shiny, obviously, as, um, as the one here, but ours does have all the bells and whistles, including all of the peripherals, documentation and manuals. Um, although I did notice this week we may be missing the software floppy, so we're going to have to go through those rooms again. Um, so like I said, ours isn't shiny and new, however... Ours has been used in many, many classrooms over many, many years. And the documentation of that work, the videos and the photographs make this val this Valiant more significant. 
and a great candidate for display and for telling that story over time. Um, Liddy has three turtles overall. These are the other two. Um, and one of them is really significant for Australia because it was made in Tasmania by Denning Branch in 1982, well before the Valiant. And whilst the Powerhouse Museum, I discovered a few weeks ago, holds three of that particular model, um, theirs were were actually required at the time of manufacture and release. So they have no provenance. They've not been used. Whereas ours has been used, like I said, in countless classrooms and wears its history on its skin. Um, you'll see it has wonky stickers for eyes and a couple of Band-Aid fixes. And if you come and look at the Valiant after the lecture finishes, you'll see on the bottom of the Valiant, I'll hold that for you with some gloves on. Um, at the bottom of the Valiant, you can see it has a luggage sticker on it with Liddy's name on it because she travelled overseas to run workshops with it. For a history curator, this stuff is golden. In the broader technology collections, we, like I said, have lots of retro technology collected by past computing curators and various technology experts. But from my experience, what we don't often have is the lived experience of that technology. What did it sound like? What did it feel like? What was it like to make it go? And what was it like compared to technology now? I've now digitised almost 150 images and more than 45 audio and video files, adding up to about 100 hours worth of media. The resulting collection documents Liddy's work with stu students during the period that computers first entered our daily lives. The collection captures the human experience, the excitement, like little Billy Brown here, but also the frustration, the lived experience of this new technology. It also spans her research at Melbourne University long before sunrise, um, where she employed screen capture technology as early as 1984. This stuff is really fascinating. I'm just gonna play you one clip, one clip of this stuff. So I think we'll have uh, two, start off with two, so it's slow. That comes, oh, eyes. yeah, that's in the middle. You have to go round, round in there. We start off with right and left, right. and you use kick to start. So we'll turn right to start off, and then we'll press kick, K. And we're moving slowly. The more Ks you do, the faster you go. You keep going, you keep drifting, like as if you were in space, until you press K again. Okay? We're going to crash when you hit the wall, see? I love it. This stuff, like I said, it's so fascinating because we get to see what the students are programming, particularly with the split screen technology, and how that actually looked for them. And then we get to understand how they interacted with each other to kind of make the thing go. We're also, we've also selected some of the students' work in various formats, be they floppy disks, I uh, haven't quite worked out how we manage that at this stage, but also dot matrix printouts like this one. I can't share tons of those pieces yet because the work continues to identify those students and seek their permission because obviously they, it's their copyright. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping I get through more of those in the life of the project. But this one I can show you. Um, and it was from Camp Biragundi, which was a week-long educational camp for Koori kids in 1984, where Liddy ran computer programming classes. And I love this because Liddy described it was a program, you can see the code, the logo code underneath, but whenever the kids were, the students, sorry, were getting um, dysregulated or they felt frustrated with learning the programming or they just didn't quite, they weren't feeling it. They could run this program, which 
I can't see the detail of from here, but Lydia and I were looking at it today. They could run the program and slowly on their screen, the Aboriginal flag would start printing up on their screen. All regu regulated, we could start again. Beautiful piece. So Chris has described the Sunrise School at the museum in some detail. And the bulk of the images and films we are acquiring are from that period. We've recently uh, digitised a 3AW radio interview from a show called Education Now. And tonight I've paired it with some images from the collection to try and give you a sense of the classroom and the interaction between students, teachers and the public. Oh, sorry, this is a photo from the launch of the Sunrise School, but here's the interview. The Sunrise School has been established at the Museum of Victoria in Melbourne to study the contribution that computers might make to the learning environment. A high-tech classroom has been set up in one of the impressive Victorian rotundas at the museum. Students from several Melbourne schools spend a day a week at the school developing their own computer-based projects with the help of their teachers and the Sunrise School's director, Liddy Neville. I have to say, having spent a lot of time with the photographs and the films this year, I'm not sure I agree with the presenter's take on a high-tech classroom. Um, there are many photos, particularly from the first weeks like this, where the students, I think Chris said that there were 10 Apple IIEs, they arrived in the boxes and that was your furniture. They took them out of the computer boxes, they put them on top of the computer boxes and voila, we have a classroom. And it was, they were set up in rows um, facing each other and the teachers just kind of would work through the, these aisles. The other thing to keep in mind is that they were shoved in behind Farlap. Um, it is a beautiful rotunda, the annex that they're talking about where they were situated, but they were kind of just, you were there the whole time, weren't you, Liddy? Poked in behind Farlap. And you would have noticed there were a lot of graphics around the walls. That was the existing interpretation around the Farlap <laughs> display at the time. They left it there when they moved, and they moved them in. So uh, it wasn't high tech, really. Over time it developed, the small, the short tables that you saw in some of the photographs enabled, were built and I think they enabled um, particularly the work with Technics and Lego controllers to work your little robots on the ground and you were kind of close to the tables. But eventually they moved, um, they developed some parts of the, the school had like lab areas with tables at normal height with computers on them and, you know, whiteboards so they could... Uh, enable teaching and um, discussion. But Liddy, uh, oh, sorry, I've just lost my page. But just like her earlier work, Liddy was constantly making observations and documenting and assessing the way the students were using computers. Chris mentioned that she didn't always get the support for um, and resources for research, but that did not stop her from <laughs> conducting research all the time and documenting everything. This image shows a group of three boys, three students, sorry, working on a self-guided project to program a soccer pitch. The image captures them testing the dimensions and specs of the pitch with Technic Lego. But here, we have a screen capture, a different kind of screen capture again, used to record them working together to begin the programming. And as I play this super brief clip, soak in the discussion and the decision-making process amidst the cacophony of sound spilling in from the rest of the museum. This is how the classroom, the school, functioned every day. 2020. 20. Yeah. Don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, you got to get back and make it even. Make it even. Back a little bit. Back. Just go about a little bit. Like five. Uh, really? That's perfect. Look like these guys are great. I know. It's like it's LT. Uh, I wish they would work. LT90. LT, we'll see. LT90. 
Uh, that's exact. Penny uh, have you done penny rice? Yeah, it's still on. It's still on. Right. Yeah, now it's perfect. Yes. Uh, is that and that same size, is it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. No, you now we have to do the little one. one. But the, the yeah. problem is. But so as I say, there is uh, many, many hours of this kind of material. Um, we have to be really selective about what we acquire into the state collection because it will be here forever in the state collection. So I'm spending a lot of time being really selective. Um, here is another type of split screen technology that Liddy employed at the time where the screen is transparently overlaid on top of the video. I'm just going to play this one. Forward 60 will go. I don't want, sorry. Okay. Okay. Now. Uh, LT, because we'll get over here. Or oh, do you want to? Yes, length 90. 90. FD. Pen's not down yet. No, doesn't FD, matter. FD, um, 100. Yeah. Yeah. Now, right 90. Oh, no. Do we just go back, okay? P, PD, yeah. It is, again, really fascinating the insight we get into how these programs worked from the user perspective. This is not something that we generally have in our technology collections. This next piece of audio, um, and my last for the presentation, is perhaps my favorite piece I've digitized so far. Whilst the student is clearly engaged and enthusiastically embracing working with computers, she bluntly sums up the effort required at the time to program. Lyndall Jones talked to some of the students about their projects. Caitlin and I made a program where a girl would dance around to the music of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and we had to work out the tone for each of the notes and how long the note would be held for and then I had special commands um, in the computer that would work for each of the notes and we typed it out and then we drew a picture of the girl and um, we made it move around using the turtle and um, that took about a month and to finally get it working properly. A month. Um, the idea of time in these um, videos comes up again and again, and it's something I know absolutely is going to blow the minds of some of our youth education audiences. And MV teachers are already um, mentioning this to me and planning how they can program this into their, into their programming at the museum. There is much, much more than what I've shown you tonight. It's really just been a brief look at the type of material that we're collecting. And if I get all the copyright permissions in place, I hope that we can acquire some images of Sunrise projects that followed Sunrise at the museum, in particular that world first um, laptop school at MLC. But by mid next year, whatever we've landed on, the entire collection will be digitised, documented and accessible on Museums Victoria's Collections Online site. We're also making a short film about the project, about Sunrise and its impact. So I do hope when it's released that you'll reach out and enjoy both. Thank you. And now on to our final speaker perhaps the star speaker of the night, if you will, Dr. Liddy Neville. Liddy started working life in the 1970s as a law lecturer, using computers to change the experience of students. This initiated an interest in how people learn and use technology. What followed has been a lifelong journey to find opportunities enabled by new technologies, for the most part, under the banner of Sunrise. Liddy's work has included research in education, digital data management, technical accessibility of digital resources, and a long association with the World Wide Web Consortium and the lifelong kindergarten groups at MIT in Massachusetts. Liddy continues work on international standards for education and accessibility of resources and chairs Victoria's Disability Discrimination Legal Service. I invite Liddy up to the stage now. Goodness.
That's me. Good evening. <laughs> I think I'm here representing actually all the many people I've worked with. An incredible number of people, very adventurous and trusting, and certainly of all ages. It's of course dangerous to let an old person talk about the past, but I think the past's here with us. I want to show you a couple of things we experienced in the past. I think what we can learn from them is still relevant. Forever humans have been inventing new technologies and, facilitated by ingenuity and politics, they've often managed to make them palatable and really change nothing. <laughs> I'm here arguing that the digital technologies have the capacity to change ever so many things, but we can't be sure that we will take advantage of them as we might. In talking about what we did, I want to use some ideas and to be clear, here they are. For me and many others, knowing is a verb. Knowledge is a funny one, but we know as an action, a thing we do. And our knowing is driven by its context and purpose and social benefit and many other factors. For me and others, learning happens as a result of building and revising what we know. We don't accept that we can pour knowing into students, but everyone has to work on it. And Mitch Resnick suggests that when they do work on learning, we see the four Ps at work. He talks about a project, a passion, persistence, and definitely peers. And I think Beck's already shown you some of that, and I'll show you more. Um, we describe ourselves, when we have this kind of philosophy, as constructionists. We like to prompt construction of knowledge. We believe we can be assisted in our learning by having appropriate disruptions to our thinking that cause us to question it and hopefully improve it. So let's explore this a bit. Recently I asked my seven-year-old grandson what I'll ask you. What's 80 times 78? He said it's 80 times 80 is 6,400 and I'll take away 80 and I'll take away 80 and then he got the answer. That's pretty amazing, I think. How would you have done it? Sort of imagining long multiplication and forgetting the O and then putting it back? That's what I would have done. He used what we call successive approximations. And I was interested in that because that's what computers do. It's a different way of thinking about solving that problem. And I think it's a bit like today's AI. People have discovered that an unintelligent computer can see a word and predict the next word for the sentence from all the past sentences and repeat doing that until it has a text for you. Doing all that very, very fast. And it's not done by a thinking brain. So how useful is what we get? I personally believe that computers with their artificial intelligence can change the way we think and learn, leading to what some are calling computational literacy. It's like algebra and the periodic table and the printing press a tool that can enable us to think differently, better. And I keep thinking that's an Aldi ad. The challenge is to adopt our, adapt our practices to do better, but we don't always do that, sadly. So let's go back to when many of us first had computers in our lives. What did we think and do then? Well, if we're going back to the Sunrise School, it's appropriate I put on the right clothes. Excuse me, dressing in public if I can. Okay. Here's me, back in the 1980s. All the children at Glamorgan Primary School, some of them you've already seen some photos of them, were programming computers and we wanted to know what they were doing and why they might do it. Some people are busy building their knowledge. The question is, where do you start? Do you start with an empty head or do you start with something that you have to change? And I wasn't sure about this, so I asked Nick and his friends what they knew about projectiles and then to write some computer programs so I could see their ideas in action. I'm eight years old and in 4C class. Good. Nick, I, want, I asked you if you would explain to me 
how things fly through the air and what happens to them. For example, if you shoot an arrow out of a bow, what happens to the arrow? And you've written some things down. Can you try and explain to me what happens to an arrow when it comes out? Well, when it fires, it goes in the air and um, and the speed of, and because it's going at a really fast speed, it'll stay in the air um, until it loses the speed and then it'll just drop down. So as it goes along, it gets slower and slower, doesn't it? Yes. Right, do you think you could draw a picture of what happens to it? I also asked James what he could tell me about projectiles. James, could you tell me what a projectile yeah. is? Projectile is when you shoot something out of a cannon or a bow or an arrow or something and it goes up and it'll go halfway on its flight and then it'll stop at the top and then it'll go down another halfway and it'll complete its flight. Now, it's common for us to give children a test, but to do this, to ask them these sort of questions, I don't think it's a regular question in a grade five classroom, and I don't think that standard of complexity is usually dealt with in grade five classrooms, but I wasn't satisfied, so I went on to ask James to explain, uh-oh, to explain a little bit more. How does it choose halfway? It just does, it just happens, sort of thing. So it always knows when it's got to the halfway point? This is when it, when it reaches the top of its flight and starts going down, it's halfway. Right. There are probably lots of things that young people just have to accept until something actually disturbs their thinking and they're prompted to actually question there must be a reason. I was pretty fascinated by this constructionism business, learning from many around the world with the same interest and attracted, as Chris has said, to the ideas of Seymour Papert from the AI lab at MIT. But these children didn't doubt what they knew and so um, we launched into developing a model of what they were explaining the projectile would do, using logo procedures, of course, um, and we can just see what they did. Now I'll start. Aim. Aim one, aim 45. And now F. F. 100 space 1.5. Well, wait a minute. It's going to be divided. It's, yeah, 0.5. Okay, let's see. That's 0.50. That's going to drop very slowly. Mm. Well, that's probably more sensible, isn't it? Yeah, well, you want a bit faster. Don't forget. Mm. Keep a look at that. Um, it comes <laughs> up <laughs> about it again. Oh, it's right getting there. better. Look, see, it's dropping more at an angle. Like it's, it's yeah, it is. It's, it's bending really. a bit. It's just the takeoff that's not right. Right. So this straight line shouldn't be quite so straight. No, the straight line should this be better. This part's nice, but this yeah. part's too straight. This I mean, part. <laughs> The boys' procedures, what most people would call programs, I suppose, needed a bit of tweaking. So they were sent outside to kick a football and see what a football did. And they suddenly realised that it didn't seem to know where to turn or how much far to turn <laughs> to end up in the right place. Um, but you might notice if you're able to read that, that these are grade five children. They're dealing with three variables for their procedure. And they're quite comfortable using decimals. I like it that it's 0.50 instead of what we'd say 0.5, but they know what it means. Um, and what they were doing, I think, is learning to talk to the computer in a way the computer would understand. And I think that's a very significant thing. I think to think of programming as a, a, a negotiation with a machine is quite a different way of thinking about programming from some of the ways that other people might have done that. And I think that the ability to do that comes from having this sense of computational thinking. How will the computer understand what I'm saying? How will it think it needs to work on this? What I think is interesting is, of course, the motivation for what they were doing was not finding out about programming or decimals or anything else. They were interested in their football. But what we could see standing watching was something that pleased us in the sense that we got a feeling that these kids were just absorbing this other way of coming to the same task, very much like my grandson's triggering with his multiplication. And you were pleased to know 
that finally they got things looking good. Now, gravity doesn't quite cause acceleration in the real way, but it does bring things to the ground in an appropriate way, and I think they have a much better understanding of projectiles as a result of that work. And to me, they seem to do much more than just solve a problem. They are engaging with these ideas enjoyably, and I think the four Ps are present. There's an example of a project that they were doing. There's certainly peer interaction. There's persistence to make the thing work. And what was the other one? And a bit of passion. They were quite excited about what they were doing. But those were little children, early 80s, programming computers, not happening everywhere around the world. And then we had the Sunrise School a little bit later in the 80s, and we actually had older children doing very similar things. And I remember one of them one day fiddling around on the computer and saying, well, I passed the test, so I thought I knew all about this, but I don't really understand it at all. That was one of the things that came out very often, that, that kids would think they knew how to do something, and then suddenly they would discover that they didn't, not somebody else putting a cross on the test, but they were trying to make it work and it wouldn't work. It had to be rethought. Older students did use the programming language the same way as these young kids. And in the example that we have, they were programming games to play on the screen, such as some would, were making a game of billiards and these particular ones looking at a project to go through a maze. So they wrote up the project. That's what you do when you're doing schoolwork. They wrote what they thought. But it was interesting because these were boys who normally wouldn't participate in anything very much if they could find a way out of it. So there they were. They did write up their project and then they said about programming. And actually it's a long and difficult program that they wrote and they had to get every single letter, full stop, whatever in the right place or the computer couldn't understand what they were doing. So it was quite a challenge to do that. So these boys were not at that time interested in this. They wanted to be outside playing soccer. What's happening now with kids is that they actually don't have to do some of this syntactic stuff. They have to think what they want to do and negotiate the program. But a lot of the syntactical work just is like Lego bricks being fitted together. The, the model came from Lego bricks literally and a lot of programming these days is just sticking things together. If they stick, that's good. If they don't stick, then something's wrong. Um, another feature of this work was that students would start to do something. I think these boys at some stage said they were doing a maze. I have no idea why they had py pyramids in amongst their program. Didn't seem to matter, but I, it makes no sense to me. But I, then I realised that some other kids were busy um, doing up uh, billiards and they needed the triangle to put the balls in. So that's where the pyramids, I think, came from. But we don't know why and it didn't matter, really. Um, just to show you this program, what these kids, if we looked at what they actually wrote down on their program, they were dealing with state, which is a very complex idea that senior kids quite often struggle with, modularity, decimals, conditionals, variables, repetition, iteration, recursion, sequencing, and interactivity. And I bet not all of you know what recursion is. That's one of those ones that we didn't learn because it wasn't around because we didn't have computers. So there are new ways of thinking of problems, some of them quite complicated, quite hard to learn, but they can make life much easier. And it's very different from being in a school and answering a question like, if Fred has two and Mary has four, what is whatever it is. So these boys are using the conditions and the processes and we believe that if you do this before meeting them in a formal context, you'll get a much better sense of what they are when you're being given the formalities. But beyond that, we had a big goal for this work. We actually learned a lot from Andy DeSessa at Berkeley, who's a colleague of ours, and he's talked a lot about computational literacy. It's understanding that there is yet another new way of thinking about things. Just like when algebra is invented, there's a new way that with computational literacy, you are able to think in a new way. And not everyone wants to do a lot of it, but understanding some of it can be incredibly useful. But for all this, it's all very well to look at the students and say, what do we think they're doing? 
it makes much more sense to ask them what they think they're doing. So we asked uh, uh, the, the students who were in our Sunrise Schools to come to the World Conference on Computers and Education in Sydney, and we had 400 teachers coming along to the workshops run by the students and then various interviews and things at the time. And I think this is a revealing little piece of uh, stuff from one of them. Lisa, what is this? Um, a merry-go-round. <laughs> and you built it? Yeah, with a group of other people. What made you decide that you wanted to understand and learn how to work and build a merry-go-round? Oh, well, it was just one of those things when we were all sitting around in a group and we'd finished a program, project that we were working on and we were, we were trying to think of what we were going to do next and just thought, oh, merry-go-round. Were you interested in mechanical engineering before you came to the Sunrise School? I didn't really think about it. I wasn't disinterested, but I wasn't interested either. So. And so something here has prompted you to go out and, and, and learn something that you may not have even uh, taken yeah. an interest in before. Yeah. What else do you think the Sunrise School can give you? Oh, a different um, point of view. When you look at things, you, I think differently than I used to think. When I look at engine engineering things, you know, like cars or um, things at the showground where they move, I think, how would you make that move? Whereas before you just looked at No, I just looked at the picture and I thought, oh, that's cute, but I didn't, never thought behind it. Have you ever been frightened of computers? Oh, I've never thought to be frightened of them. I suppose I might have been, but I didn't recognise it if I was. So what do you think of a computer as now? Oh, well, sometimes they can be a bit daunting if you, or frustrating if you can't get them to understand what you want to say because they use a different language than you speak like. So it's opened new horizons for you? Yeah, I suppose so. I think that's fantastic because that's 40 years ago. I think it's really interesting. And I love her merry-go-round. It doesn't look anything like a merry-go-round to me, but typically students would make whatever they made and tell you what it was, and it would be hard to recognise that it was <laughs> what they would clearly uh, thought it was. So thank you. We could thanks so much. Um, we're going to open up for some questions now. Um, we, Kate was going to ask questions from online, but we don't have any visitors online. Um, so if you do have a question, just raise your hand and uh, we have two microphone attendants who can bring them over. We've got one over here. in yeah no that's fine I'm really interested in um, this idea of the kids kind of withdrawing their consent of, of walking away um, that seems like a constructivist approach they've they've taken charge of what they're doing and taken charge of their learning can you just tell us kind of how that came about and what happened I just missed the first bit of your question Jonathan. The, Chris in his bit said that two years in, the kids got together and went, we don't want to do this anymore. This is, I don't know, too hard or... or. I think I'll give the answer to that because I was there um, and there are some others that were there. The problem was we really never set it up. We never had an established place and these children came from school and they were... A lot, all sorts of interests those kids had, but they were really concerned about what they were missing out on and that some of them actually went home at night and their parents said, oh, even though the school doesn't worry about you know, that and thinks that the computing is good. You need to do the maths that the kids did at school this afternoon. So they were burdened by having to run two lots of schooling. They, they brought the school bells in their ears. Even though we didn't have any school bells, they behaved as if they were there. They were constantly in this thing, but one way and the other. And I think the other thing was we made a classic mistake. We thought it would be really fascinating to sit down in front of a computer twice a week. And the kids said, come on, come on, there's more interesting things in the world than doing that every, <laughs> every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 o'clock for two hours. So, you know, we, we didn't really... We made the mistakes that I think people made in computer labs all around the world. 
And, and to think that the computer was magically solve all the problems, it wouldn't. Had we put them on the floor and had more Lego and, and, not, and had it at school and so on. But I do take the point that the reason we got into the museum as, from our perspective rather than to schools was not really that we were rejecting schools, but we were being challenged by our colleagues around the world, do something really different. And you may not remember, but back in the 80s, we were unsure about schooling, just like people are freaking out now about AI in school. People were very worried about what computers might do in schools. And, um, you know, so maybe we could take away some of this pressure. Well, we didn't succeed, but we hoped. <laughs> When were computers created? When were computers? Well, a very long time ago, but they did, they did sort of adding up and subtracting and stuff like that. They didn't do all the things that you know them doing today. But I'm interested actually in, in I mean, that we all know this magic thing that these young children are the natives of the new generation. I don't think they're doing computational thinking very often at all. I don't know if they even get a chance to. I think they're doing a lot of using applications to make things happen more, faster, and, and so on. With, but they're not actually, it's, it's quantity rather than quality. And I think our idea is very much about the quality of the computational literacy will make things different. Are there any other questions? Oh, in the front row here, Alice. Yep. Uh, actually, if we do it with the microphone, then the recording will pick it up. Um. Something that really jumped out at me was the sort of eloquence and apparent sort of um, educational level of some of the younger kids in that video. And it, the first thing that jumped to mind is that how far we, we appear to have regressed in terms of um, our current students at that age, their understanding of basic concepts and what do you think? Because we live now in a time where technology is abundant, it's everywhere, our access to information and our access to the ability to learn should be uh, easier and more accessible than it's ever been, yet we seem to be regressing educationally. What, uh, I, I, I'm happy to have a go at that because I think it's a great question. I, I think that the, I agree with you. I think that potentially we, we could be way, way ahead of where we are and somehow we don't seem to be very much ahead of where we were. And I think it's because it's very difficult to change things and we're not quite sure how to change them and we're not prepared to take the risk quite often. We, we like to be a little bit controlled, a little bit sure we're under control. I mean, I don't know, if we, how would you run NAPLAN tests on the sort of stuff we were doing with those kids? And yet those kids were clearly learning a lot. So we, we really have a, a problem, I think, of, of how can we imagine a world where children are able to to move at their own pace, all of them differently, da 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 da. So politically, it's a hard one. Alice, we've got one. Oh, oh I, might, I, might, Chris, Chris, I might have Chris a little. Yeah. I might just have a little go at that as well. I mean, I think um, the the system's changed quite a lot uh, since since the eighties, since I went through the system, and and uh, I was a classroom teacher in the early two thousands, and um, remained kind of connected with the sector and still a registered teacher. Um, and, and, and the classroom structures and the types of thinking around progressive education and, and constructivist thinking have been integrated into the, into the school system. I think there has been significant changes over the past 30 to 40 years around that. And it's represented in the architecture of schools. So classrooms now are, are, are much differently structured, allowing kind of much more collaborative um, learning space. And we've seen that although actually it's been quite slow to be adopted into higher education, we've seen that coming in with like the flipped classroom and those sort of things. So we've seen changes to that aspect of the system. Um, but I think, I think your question is, is really about the sort of the levels of kind of individual engagement with the work. I think it's quite varied. Um, you've got to remember that we're looking at a selection of material here that doesn't necessarily represent it, represent a wide spectrum um, of students. So I think it's a kind of combination of those things. But there um, has been some some advances in, in the past, you know, thirty to forty years that have taken this notion from the Sunrise, Sunrise School and other experiments around and explorations around more constructivist learning and 
have changed classroom practice? I want to come back and answer your question properly because I didn't. Um, I was reading some words of Seymour Papert's today and I, and I didn't even bring them to us. The point that I'm trying to make but don't make very well is I think something that Seymour taught us that's very interesting. The work that the children are doing with the driving the turtle around the screen um, is geometry and actually can be very sophisticated geometry. But it doesn't feel like geometry because it's been turned into driving a remote toy. And so the, the point that Seymour makes is that if we could use the technology to re-describe the things that we're working on, then the complexity wouldn't baffle the children because children de deal with complex things. It's that we're trying to give our perspective on that thing Whereas turtle geometry, driving it around there, is about telling something what to do and doing it in the way that you'd move your own body. So it's not the exterior angle and the interior angle and stuff that I learnt at school. It's about turn right 90 degrees or 25. So I think you've got a really interesting question there that the, the really hard challenge is how can we make the complex ideas, which are around us all the time, uh, expressed in a form that a young person can understand what you're saying and, and can see it. And that's a challenge. That's, and it takes huge expertise in chemistry, science, or music, or whatever, to distill that. Are things too intuitive now? As in, we've taken away... No, they're not. I, don't, I think we just don't know. Yeah. OK, we have a question here in the mid-row. Yeah. Thank you. I was really interested in that last video with the, uh, the young female student uh, saying that she'd never really thought one way or the other about mechanical engineering and mechanical systems. I am a mechanical engineer and I know that this is still a really big problem for getting um, students interested in engineering and particularly uh, female students interested in engineering. They just don't think about it at all. Is there any evidence, or, or do we know anything about whether any of the students from the Sunrise School went on to pursue further education or careers in STEM areas? I, I can tell you one little story that makes me feel good, at least. Uh, my son and I both work on accessibility, and accessibility is how can you make the digital information available to people who perhaps want no vision or no sound or no this or no that. So can you make digital information accessible to everyone? And there's some outstanding people in this field in Australia. And my son and I quite often meet them and um, we say to them, why do you do what do you do? Oh, well, ages ago I was at so-and-so and this sunrise thing set up and I just, uh, it got under my skin and I just do it. Now I can actually tell you there are a number of really outstanding people working in the field now who just got, uh, you know, something available to them a different way. I think that is evidence. I don't think that says everyone will do it, but I think it says there is evidence that it can make an enormous difference. Um, and partly what we were doing, uh, Chris is saying about the research, what we would doing is focusing very much on what can an individual do, not with the sense, oh, well, therefore we can generalise it, but if we could find out what an individual could do, we'd get some inklings of what sort of things we might be thinking about and asking questions. And I think that's fairly unusual research in education. Normally it's, you know, 40% do this and 80% do that and something or other. Um, and we were very much working with my colleagues from the Institute of Education in London who said, let's look with precision at what a single person does. Also, uh, part of the documentation of the collection at the moment has included reaching out to all of the students. So I'm just getting to know them all now. Um, I've got all their names, how we were able to identify them all um, and their contacts. And in the next kind of stage of the project, we'll be doing exactly that, kind of connecting with them and getting a sense of um, the lasting legacy of that program in their lives. Uh, we have another question at the mid row and one at the front here, and that might actually have to be our last two questions for the night. Um, I was teaching computers at the senior secondary school level in the 80s, and at that time, many students had 
computers at home, like a Commodore 64 or something. Um, of course, their computers there weren't, weren't a vehicle for connecting to the internet. They were things where people would, like, like we've seen here, they'd think of something interesting they'd like to do and they'd work out a way to programming it and so on. So um, uh, I found it was, was good and it meant also, as a teacher, when I was teaching, I learnt a lot from my students <laughs> at that stage. So would you like to comment in, in any case, was the Sunrise Project interacting with students, was there interaction between what students were doing at home with their home computers as well? Well, uh, I mean, we said the Sunrise Collection's about two years in what I think is 50 years of work I did. And what we very quickly found was that this name, personal computing, meant personal. And the students needed their own computer. They needed to be able to have lots of time to do what they were doing. And it very much meant that at home, at school, ought to just, we ought to just take that away. I mean, you're a different place, but you could keep on doing the same thing. And at MLC, um, I think it showed us that the students chose to do at home things that didn't work very well with friends, and then they'd save the work that you could do with friends for school. So I think that the home, you know, that 24-hour thing is actually very important. And so, yeah, I take your point very much that whatever happened at home um, was often quite consequential. Yeah. Take this question here. Hi. Um, uh, probably a slightly less diligent question than the ones that have been so far, but um, uh, you said uh, at the start that um, you guys had some disagreements about what might be important and not important. I'm kind of curious what didn't make it in that you would have really loved to have made it in. Yeah, I'd say Lydia and I have disagreed on pretty much everything from the first day. Um, Get it on but, the record now. Yeah, no, look, it's I, I fundamentally some of the biggest things that we've disagreed about is um, significance. Um, I, I wear my history curator-ness on my sleeve. Um, I'm always looking at the collection bigger and broader than just the project that we're in. Um, the state collection and contributing to it is a huge responsibility. Um, it is your collection, all of your collection, and it takes all of your tax dollars to care for it long term. I'm looking in the audience here at some collection managers and curators who know what I'm talking about. So there were a lot of discussions, even from the first days, like coming out to see all the material at Liddy's house. Um, I suppose I bought a lens that is longer term. Um, and Liddy's, as you've seen, is really passionate about the work she's been doing her entire adult life and I think will always do. And so, yeah, we've wrestled over that a bit. But I think we're getting to the point now where we understand where each of us are coming from. We've also um, – we've battled a lot about the, the kind of boundaries around what we're doing. We still – we haven't completely – I don't – I mean, we battle and that's probably the way I do things. But I think it's about – it's really hard to understand and trying to understand all the time. How do you do two years in something where you think, well, that actually had a ramification here and there and started there? And, and it's been very hard to work out. I, I very much appreciate that Beck is working in a museum and I'm not, so that's, that's true. Um, but what has certainly happened to me is that I'm very aware of the incredible people that I've worked with in those 50 years and I'm now setting about documenting the whole lot, which is actually really going to keep me going till I'm in the box. Um. And I have to say, Liddy, that is kind of the... That's the best outcome as a history curator you can ever ask for because we have a responsibility at, at the state institution collecting for the state collection, a, a really wise senior curator who's not in Australia anymore, Char Dr Charlotte Smith once said to me, we can't collect it all. In fact, you should never collect it all. Um, editing and selecting is exactly, exactly the work of the curator. But on every project, we all see the things that we didn't collect or we wish we could have selected. I mean, our, our state collection is already beyond 100% capacity. What are we currently at? Like 110% or something. So 
we really have to keep this in mind. And so on projects where you have someone passionate enough to then take the, the torch and say, well, I'm going to document everything completely for the rest of my life, then that's wonderful because um, those other people will be documented and noted. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I'd like to just tell you a, a little side thing that we've got here is I did say to Beck we better do something pretty pretty weird, special and new when we get this collection together. So I suggested that we could actually work up a metadata scheme of, for describing the intangible stuff, the, the philosophies and practices and whatever that go along with these devices. And... That's what telematics has helped us set up and it's very challenging and I'm actually finding that all around the world people are putting objects into museums but we don't yet have a way of describing the stuff that is why this computer in this context is a completely different kind of thing from the same computer in another context. And so that's a, a metadata project which Chris and I are going to struggle with at some time. <laughs> I might have a little way into this um, discussion as well. Um, this is the first time I've worked in a museum and uh, I've often been on the other side of the counter using the materials. Um, and for me, thinking about what goes in and out, it's been really interesting. We've got sort of um, Beck's kind of understanding of, you know, the collect limitations around the collection. We've got Liddy's, you know, full life, wants it all documented, let's write the whole thing down. And I'm coming from the middle point of view, I think, of saying, what are the stories here? Where's the narrative here that shows impact? So you probably saw in my presentation, I'm really interested in thinking about the sort of logics of why things happen and, and trying to draw out, you know, a story about a selection of material and try to, I mean, it's like writing a PhD, trying to work out where the boundaries are for the start and finish of these things. So it's... Um, it's been an interesting three-way battle, uh, which will continue That's next year. That's why you're year. in the middle. <laughs> Thanks. There'll be another round next Wednesday. So on that note, I'm going to call this uh, to a close. I want to thank you all. And um, I, before I close off, can we have on the screen, please, the slide for next? So... I'll just give a, sh a wee shout out to next month's MV lecture, uh, Megalodon and the Age of Ocean Giants, which is on the 28th of November at 6 p.m. Um, the speakers for that event are Professor Tim Flannery and Dr. Eric Fitzgerald, our own Eric Fris 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 oh goodness Fitzgerald, uh, and Professor Dr. Cheng Sui Sai. I'm so sorry if I butchered that. Um, and it will be moderated by uh, Natasha Mitchell. And um, the conversation about will be about the evolution of ocean giants from megalodon, sharks, to living leviathans like the blue whale and the crucial role they play in shaping oceanic ecosystems. And it's from 5 p.m., so slightly earlier than our usu usual lecture, but at this one you get refreshments and a chance to network, <laughs> clearly funded by... CAVEPS conference. Um, I do hope you uh, get a chance to book a ticket and come along to that one. But ultimately, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. It's been delightful for us to finally kind of deliver this baby out into the world. I hope you get a chance to come and look at some of the robots afterwards. But can you please join me in thanking our speakers tonight? Thank you.